More actuators installed on Test Tank 16 at Massey's. Ship Quick Disconnect arm parts arrived at Sanchez. A new ship getting stacked at the build site. And there's a full stack in progress at the launch site. Hey everyone and welcome on board to RGV Aerial Photography's Starbase Flyover Update Episode 58. I'm Jeff A, your guide for today. We'll be covering updates at SpaceX's Starbase facilities cruising at an altitude of 10,500 feet. These photos were taken on the 21st of September with some additional ground shots. We have overflights starting at the Massey's test site, Sanchez and the build site, with our final destination being the launch site. So fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the flight. Here's a labelled map to get you familiar with the layout of the site. Thanks to Procky for creating these. Beginning with events over the past week, Ship 31 conducted a static fire on Thursday, September 19th. Thanks to SpaceX for posting this amazing footage of the test. Ship 31 was then moved back to the production site on Friday, September 20th. Now let's have a look at some changes at the site, shall we? Looking at the bottom of the structural test stand, we can see hardware that is used to test the aerodynamic forces of the aft flaps during flight. Views this week show that at this location and the higher position mentioned last week consist of two actuators to apply lateral forces to the hinge points. The lower point previously unseen also appears to have a small portion of an aft flap attached to the vehicle actuator to place loads not only on the structural hinge points but also the actuator that moves the flap. With little to see at Massey's, let's take a look at the airport storage lot where the four wrapped items that may be heat exchangers have been lifted away. The two wrapped items that appear to be cryopump sleeves have also been relocated. Now let's move over to the Sanchez site. Here's this week's map to get you orientated. Let's begin our tour at the most critical site at Sanchez, the speculated new OLM construction area. The pedestals that were staged to the side of the embeds are now bolted to them. This is the beginning of the expected construction work for this structure, where everything will be put on top of these pedestals for a completely level environment. In addition, four bigger pedestals were delivered, which might be part of the legs for this structure, or maybe temporary ones to simplify the construction process. Also to the left of these, a boosted QD plate-like structure appeared, adding to the speculation of the OLM being built here. As always, we will keep an eye out on this very important development. Moving farther to the left, the cable chain for the second set of chopsticks arrived. This gets installed in the carriage and moves with the arms all the way up and down the tower. It appears to have hydraulic, electrical and data lines installed. A very good progress on this end too. Speaking of the chopsticks, some work started to get done on them as the stops were removed. We can see that reinforcement parts are staged, waiting to be welded on. This should be the same work we saw on Pad A chopsticks during the last few weeks. To finish up the Tower B development, the long-awaited SQD arm parts arrived ahead of construction. As far as we can see, there are no significant changes compared to the first QD arm, but we need to recheck that after it gets built in the next few weeks. Now, at the storage site, the area that has been cleared of item racks has parking lots painted. Strangely, they are squares rather than rectangles, and they have numbers assigned to them. Over near the booster transport stand area, a new construction base for the Star Factory has been assembled from the parts previously spotted over by the inventory tent. So far, we haven't seen any parts for the booster aft jig that is speculated to be part of this stand. Rolling to the rocket garden, S-30 is no longer here. It rolled to the launch site on the 20th ahead of stacking with booster 12 for integrated testing this week. Hopefully by the time you watch this video, testing should have already taken place. Booster 4's aft section continues to make progress towards scrapping, with additional Raptor engines removed this week. Looking at this ground image, we can also see some of the decorative facade being added to the parking garage. We can see that some of this has some edges matching the factory glass geometry. Finally, some work has been done at the turf field, used by employee-only Starship presentations in the last couple of months. All the turf has been removed, maybe to be replaced, but we'll see. Now let's take a look at the build site. And here we are, where SpaceX has started the stacking of a new ship. Starting at Mega Bay 2, this ground shot shows the worker accessible platform surrounding the centre engine stand. This will allow easy access to the ship's heat shield. On the left of the stand, we see Ship 33 fully stacked after its aft flaps were fully installed on September 18th. And on the right sits the turntable meant for ship stacking, still surrounded with scaffolding. Once this scaffolding is removed, Block 2 ships will be able to be stacked in Mega Bay 2 instead of the High Bay. Meanwhile, we were able to get a sneaky view within Mega Bay 1. Here we can see the methane section of Booster 15 is staged to be stacked on top of the LOX tank, completing another Booster full stack. 
As of September 19th, after Booster 12 left the launch site, no visible changes were observed to Booster 13 and 14. Now looking at the high bay, Ship 34's nose cone was rolled out of the Star Factory for stacking on September 19th. This footage from La Padre shows the nose cone entering the bay, joining the three ring payload barrel section rolled out a few hours earlier. While on the topic of new hardware, Lab Padre's Rover 1 also spotted a steel delivery of 3mm stainless steel. Current barrels use steel that is 4mm thick, with the exception of the payload barrel which is 3.6mm. This particular delivery is bound for a booster landing header tank, as seen by the 114 inch diameter. That's equal to 2.9 metres. Inside the Star Factory, Starbase Surfer has spotted a ship Block 2 nose cone being worked on. Jenna Hammer took this photo on the early morning of September 20th of the hot stage ring rolling out to the launch site for installation on Booster 12. We were a little confused why this wasn't done in Mega Bay 1, but it could be to do with the lift test that was conducted with the tower, but more on that later. By the way, a big thanks to the photographers who allow their content to be used in RGV's videos. Make sure to give them a follow on X. While on the ground, we can see that the new Star Factory door has received doors and windows. Moving over to the factory, the new layer of material appears to be topsoil. Does this mean that there will be a grassy strip between the factory and Highway 4? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Switching back to an aerial view now, we can see a larger area of Star Factory's roof has been cleaned since last week. Over at the connection to the office building, work has started on lifting the steel beams to connect the two buildings. Meanwhile, on the roof of the office building, workers have made progress installing the insulation materials. The ground floor windows have been installed, and looking at the mounting brackets, seem to be terminating at the stud wall, which will continue along to match the front of the factory. And finally, we now have a clue on what the square-shaped room in the third section is for. A large vent can be seen, which may indicate it's a mechanical room, separate from the offices. While out and about, RGV caught sight of this interesting wrap on a Cybertruck. The Japanese text on the rear quarter panel reads, Mecha Godzilla. Let's move to the launch site now. Let's first take a look at this week's labelled map. With the return of the full stack on pad A, this week we will work our way in reverse. While not completely set down on the booster, this low altitude image shows ship 30 just above booster 12. To recap how we got here, Booster 12 has led to the launch site during the early morning hours of September 20th, just behind the hot stage ring. Later that morning, Booster 12 would be lifted onto the OLM, but would first be lifted higher on the tower to the expected catch height, as posted here by Elon on X. Once this lift test was completed, the booster was placed on the OLM as usual. The next morning, under the cover of night, its hot stage ring would be lifted on top seen here in a ground image from the morning of the flyover. In this image, we can also see the tapered stringers that help the bumpers of the chopsticks slide up the booster's methane tank and up to the lift pins that are on the reinforced forward section of the booster. Lower on the booster, we can also see additional tapered stringers that have been added over the booster's stabiliser points. These again will prevent the bumpers from damaging the connection point if the chopsticks contact the booster below these points during the first catch attempt. On September 20th, a noon transport closure originally designated as an alternate time for Ship 31 to return from Massey's would be used to move Ship 30 to the launch site, seen here already connected to the chopsticks. Due to the perfect timing of this flyover, we were able to capture Ship 30 at many stages of the lifting process, including this wide shot of the entire launch site. Over the course of the following couple of days, tests would be executed on the SQD, booster grid fins, ship flaps, as well as activation of the DSS under the launch mount. A testing closure was scheduled for September 23rd, with alternates for the 24th and 25th. It's expected that these closures will be to complete a wet dress rehearsal in preparation of Flight 5, currently expected no earlier than late November, according to the latest updates from the FAA. This is further delayed from the previous estimate from the FAA of late September, as previously reported. This is due to additional regulatory hurdles being navigated due to permitting issues related to the deluge system at Pad A, as well as additional consultation between the FAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service deemed necessary to issue a license modification for Flight 5. Until recently, SpaceX claimed to have been operating the deluge system under a Texas multi-sector general permit. More recently, it has been determined that the deluge system discharge is considered industrial wastewater, requiring an individual TPDES permit to be issued for use. 
While it is unknown how long this permit will take to be obtained, it is possible that there is a process that could allow them to use the deluge in the near future while the full permit is acquired, as it can take many months and up to nearly a year to be approved. This permit was applied for on July 1st, 2024. Not having this proper permit resulted in SpaceX being fined for seven activations of the deluge plate without proper approvals. The other consultation is related to the booster's hot stage ring, as the location of the separation is being changed with the catch attempt for Flight 5, triggering an additional study into how the new location may be impacted by the hot stage ring splashdown. Elon and SpaceX have been quite vocal over the past couple of weeks regarding these matters, and the push to stack the Flight 5 vehicles appears not to only verify its readiness to fly, but perhaps seek awareness from the public and government oversight regarding the timely review of license modifications as continued delays in this process risk setbacks to other programs including Starship's role in the Artemis program. Turning our attention back to the flyover images, we can see that the work on the tower and chopsticks seems to have been completed. With the chopsticks at nearly full height, we get a slightly clearer view. Here we can see the travel stops reinstalled. If we come down to this ground image from before the ship was stacked, we can see the fresh coat of black paint that protects the additional reinforcements that have been seen these recent weeks. Here we can see that the tower itself has been cleared of the scaffolding that was allowing crews to attach the new gusset plates that were added. Shifting over to the orbital tank farm, further work can now be seen as a new Malcolm drill rig has arrived to install concrete piles in these two areas, where the concrete pad has begun preparations. The areas being prepared seem to be the size compatible with the two white horizontal tanks that are at the Sanchez site. This week saw some new work started at the Deluge tank farm, with four of the six vertical manifold pipes being removed from some of the high pressure nitrogen tanks. Most of these tanks have never been connected to the system, so we'll have to see what replaces them, or if the tanks themselves have a different future. Moving over to the construction at Pad B, the flame trench area continues to see ongoing work, with the jet grouting process, however it appears general excavation of the site is yet to begin. Looking up the tower, this week we can see that the concrete pipe used for filling the tower legs is now connected at the Module 6 fill ports, as they make progress towards the top. Turning back to this ground image, we can also see that the remaining carriage rail segments at the module junctions have now been completed. Here we can see that the CC-8800 has been raised, with the SQD arm just arriving in pieces and the lack of chopsticks hardware movement. We may have to wait a bit longer to see this being used again. In the base of the tower, we can see some precast concrete trench shells have been placed within the base, with another sitting nearby on some crane mats. These are likely to house the cryo pipe work leading to the tower. Looking from directly above, we can see the progress being made on the electrical conduits that passed under the fluids bunker. These pipes were in the process of being covered in concrete and we noticed that the ends have been capped off, suggesting that last week's observation of trench backfilling may not have indicated installation of conduits all the way to the vaults near the SpaceX sign entrance. Well that wraps up our tour of the launch site. However, we will end today's episode with an unexpected development that was first investigated by the Interstellar Gateway, whose members include our very own contributors Emlyn and the Space Engineer, as that team was following suspected exploration of the site of B-11's landing in the Gulf of Mexico. On September 22nd, they were able to report on the activities they witnessed of the HOS Ridgewind. We were able to photograph this vessel a few weeks back as it was in the port of Brownsville to pick up divers. In this post, they were able to photograph the Ridgewind with possible parts of B-11 on its aft deck. They would go on to inform that through contact with SpaceX that this was an official salvage operation for B-11 hardware. A couple of hours after they posted their findings, Elon would further confirm the investigation with this post to X showing a portion of B-11's aft section with many of its outer 20 engines still attached. Well that's it for episode 58 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography and I hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week. And leave a thumbs up. I'm Jeff A and we'll see you next week from 10,500 feet. That's all for now.